Hello from the Mackinac Policy Conference. At this annual event, 1,700 top business, government, and civic leaders are engaged in impactful discussions about the future of Michigan. That's why I'm so pleased to partner with Detroit Public Television, which makes available to the public, both online and on your television set, the sessions of this conference. One of those sessions is tonight's gubernatorial debate. This debate will be unique. It's the first time the top polling candidates from both parties will share a stage in an actual debate format. Thank you for watching and for being part of this important conversation. Funding is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation, DTE Energy Foundation, and ITC. And welcome to the bipartisan gubernatorial debate at the Mackinac Policy Conference here on Mackinac Island. I'm Christy McDonald with Detroit Public Television. I'll be moderating tonight's debate along with my colleagues on my week, Stephen Henderson and Nolan Finley. The candidates have agreed to our hour-long format. We will ask questions to groupings of candidates. Not all candidates will get to answer every question on every topic, and that is to make sure that we get to as many questions as possible tonight. They each have a minute to answer with a 30-second rebuttal. There will be closing statements at the end, and we will enforce the time rules. With that, let me introduce the candidates in alphabetical order by party, and please hold your applause until the end. Abdul Al-Sayed. Brian Kelly, Sri Tenadar, Patrick Kolbeck, Gretchen Whitmer, and Bill Schuette. All right, we're going to start off tonight. Nolan has the first question to the three Republican candidates. Nolan. Infrastructure has been a hot topic up here all week. What's your specific plan for finally fixing Michigan's horrific roads, and are you willing to raise taxes to do so? If not, how will you pay for it? Brian Kelly, we'll start with you. Generations of politicians have failed us on this, have failed us on this question. We have just passed a $1.2 billion road funding plan that is rolling into place right now in our state. You're gonna see more construction this year than maybe you've seen over the course of your entire life but we're also paying off the debt that the previous administrations saddled us with. We're about halfway done paying it off. When we pay off the rest of it, there'll be an extra $200 million that goes into our roads each and every year. Once we're rebuilding roads like we can now, the, that's where the higher standards kick in, things like road warranties and also integrated asset management where we expect everybody who shares your right away to get their work done at the same time so you don't tear up the roads over and over again. We're also embedding technology into our roads in order to engineer projects better and to make our, our roads work better for congestion for our citizens. We put all these things together and we'll have a better future for Michigan roads. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Colbert? Yeah, first of all, there's no need to increase taxes to go off and fix our roads. The focus needs to be on quality. As a matter of fact, when we pass that $600 million tax increase for uh, gas tax and vehicle registration fees, right after we pass that, we transferred $400 million in general fund from the transportation budget to backfill potholes in other budget areas like Medicaid expansion or Healthy Michigan. Uh, so the key to actually fixing our roads, which is something that I've been very outspoken on, is to upgrade our roads. Go from these version one roads that aren't lasting very long to a version two higher quality road that lasts three to four times as long. I've identified road construction methods that actually can get us to that point. I'm an engineer. If you want to fix the roads for good, get an engineer involved in fixing it. We focus on total life cycle costs. It's not just the cost of fixing an individual road segment. It's the total life cycle cost, and with me, you're going to have them fixed. Thank you. Uh, My wife, Cynthia, and I are delighted to be here along with our son, Bill. Uh, daughter, Heidi, couldn't make it uh, tonight, but thank you for gathering us together. Governor and Mrs. Snyder, thank you for being here as well. With respect to roads, here's what we need to do. Uh, number one, we need to have a complete review of the operation of the Michigan Department of Transportation to make sure we're getting more miles per gallon paved. So it ought to be a miles paved per gallon. Let's make sure citizens across the state know what they're getting when they pay at the pump. Secondly, we need to eliminate the prevailing wage statute in Michigan, which will free up another $250 million to go right towards the roads. And what we ought to do is make sure that we have 
people working together in this budget that is a $56 billion budget. We ought to be able to get money to the roads without raising taxes. You have each 30 seconds for a rebuttal if you choose to use it. Uh, we'll start with Brian Kelly. Because of our growing economy in Michigan, we are now dedicating more resources to roads, 300 million more in the budget agreement that was just reached. I want to point out that while I do favor the repeal of the prevailing wage, that as a practical matter, that won't impact the cost of our roads unless we see a change in Washington. Mr. Colbeck? We need to focus on quality. I've got a bill right now before the legislature, Senate Bill 210, that would uh, require transparency on who designed, who built, and who inspected our road segments throughout the state. Um, I think when you go off and hold people accountable, I'm an old uh, management consultant, total quality management principle is what gets measured gets done. We need to focus on quality, and uh, you'll get the roads fixed if you focus on quality. Bill Schutte? I'm running for governor because we need more jobs, more people, and bigger paychecks. And there's not one problem, not one problem that wouldn't be lessened if we had more people in the state, if we were a growth state. So we'd have more people paying taxes, going to the pump, and buying gas. So I, I want to make sure we have higher paychecks and more people in, in Michigan. That's my strategy for the future. All right, the next question is going to go to the three Democrats who are candidates. Several reports analyzing K-12 education improvement in Michigan focus on funding and it focuses on leadership structure. As governor, what priority is K-12 education? How would you change funding for schools and governance structure with the Department of Education? Abdul Al-Sayed, we'll start with you. It's been a long seven years. Long seven years where we have watched as this administration has disinvested in our public schools. We've watched as they've enacted a Betsy DeVos agenda where you see these corporate-backed charter schools come in, make a buck off of the money that we're supposed to pay in taxes, and it has left us with one of the worst education systems in the country. We've got a responsibility to stand up, and that means funding more, funding more equitably, and making sure that we're cutting out the profit margin that so many folks want to back despite the fact that it hasn't worked for our schools. But let's be clear about something. If we want to be honest about how we're going to rebuild, we've got to make sure that we're holding corporations accountable. Because the money that we use to subsidize corporations over and over and over again has gone right to them when it should be going into our schools. This is possible, but we've got to make sure everybody pays their fair share. We've got to fund more, fund more equitably, and end this profit motive in public schools. Public school has to stay public. Sri Tanandar. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for hosting this event. Uh, I want to be the education governor Michigan never had, because education is not just talking points for me. I grew up in poverty, and education was the ladder for my success, and that ladder is broken for too many Michiganders. I want to invest in education in a future of our children very early with a universal pre-K early education. That's where we start investing our children. I have one, we have a grandson, 15 months old. We see how young children learn, and I want to start that very early in their life. We need to invest in K-12. Certainly, we pay, what, $9,000 per pupil and $40,000 per prisoner. We need to t respect our teachers, pay them well, and we need to focus on in education. Gretchen Whitmer. Well, thank you. And I want to thank Detroit Public Television for having us in the chamber and the three of you for moderating. You know, the key to a good job is a good education. And we are failing generations of kids in Michigan. The raids on the school aid fund started under a governor of my own party who I took on because my biggest fear was that dollars would start getting pulled out of the school aid fund to backfill the general fund. And frankly, in the last eight years, that's just exploded. $750 million is taken out of our kids' education and put into the general fund every single year. This was the state that people used to move to for opportunity, a great paying job that you could raise a family on and retire with dignity. You knew that no matter what community you moved into, your kids were going to get a top-notch public school education. We have to hold the line, and I've got a backbone of titanium, and I'm going to make sure that those education dollars go into educating our kids in Michigan. Rebuttal, Abdul Al-Sayed. Yeah, I want to talk specifics for a second. I've got a baby girl at home, and I want to send her to a public school. I got to inspect those schools in Detroit. I saw a dead mouse in the corner. Nobody 
should ever have to go to school in that circumstance. But I also think she should start school at three, not five, because she's the best learner she'll ever be at her youngest age. And it also means too many families are taking on too much debt to go to college. Every student that comes from a family earning less than $150,000 a year should graduate debt-free. We do those things, we make this the place that grows population, like the Attorney General said. That's what we have to do. Shri Tanandar, 30 seconds. I met two teachers from Farmington School District. I saw them paying money out of their own pocket, Judy and Rachel. And they're buying supplies at Office Max for their uh, school project. And that's no way to run our education system. We, we need to provide the necessary funding we need so our schools will be safe. We have the enough support staff for our teachers to be able to teach and our students to be learned in a safe environment. Absolutely no guns in schools, no guns with teachers. Gretchen Whitmer. The pillars of a great education meet require a great teacher in the classroom. We have teachers in Michigan who are on food stamps. I want you to think about that for a minute. We have an attorney general who goes to court and says there's no constitutional right to literacy. I believe every child in this state has a birthright to a phenomenal public school education and a path to a high wage job. Okay, the next question goes to Bill Schutte and Gretchen Whitmer. I'm gonna talk about the economy. If you were elected governor, would you continue Michigan on its current economic course or do you think we need to make drastic changes? And I'd like each of you to specifically address what you would do with, with regard to taxes. Uh, we're going to start with Bill Schutte. You bet. You know, our future is about uh, more jobs and bigger paychecks. And there's frankly no bigger contrast in terms of Michigan's future than between my vision and, and the Democrat colleagues here uh, on the stage, because their answer is more taxes, more m rules, and more regulations, which is you know, a sequel to the failed governorship of Jennifer Granholm. What I want to do is drive a stake through the legacy of the, uh, of the governorship of Jennifer Granholm, eliminate the uh, income tax increase that's never been rolled back. It's cost Michigan taxpayers. $8 billion. We need to cut auto insurance rates. We have the highest auto insurance rates in America. That needs to be changed. And conversely, our third grade reading scores are in the, in the bottom of, of the heap. When only 35% of our students are, have proficiency in reading, they've been failed and their future's not positive. So I want to cut taxes, I want to cut auto insurance rates, and that and uh, sharpen every, every tool in our economic toolbox. That's why I have growth, and that's where we go from good to great in the state of Michigan. Gretchen Whitmer. Well, I think it's amazing to hear the Attorney General talk about literacy because he's the one in court that says kids don't have a constitutional right to literacy. Now, if we want to make Michigan a place where our economy grows in a way that grows our family incomes, we got to fix the damn roads. We got to get serious about a two year talent investment. I'm not just put taking positions like a lot of people. I have real plans that I've put on the table. I enrolled my jobs and economy plan two days ago, and you know what it surrounds? A two-year talent investment, so every one of us has a path to a high-wage skill, a debt-free community college degree, or using that kind of investment toward the cost of a four-year degree, or a path into the skilled trades. A job blitz. We could do a 52-week job blitz with the MEDC and get to work throwing shovels in the ground. These are the fundamentals that families in all 83 counties need their governor to fix. Rebuttal, Bill Schutte. You bet. You know, President Trump has cut taxes in America and means removing the production of the Ram truck from Mexico to Macomb. That's, you know, a billion dollar investment, more jobs in Michigan. And that's one reason President Trump has endorsed my candidacy. He knows I'm going to cut taxes in Michigan like he's cut taxes in America. And Senator Whitmer's uh, plans for uh, more taxes and more rules and regulations, it is an economic collapse plan which would send Michigan back to the uh, time of Jennifer Granholm. We can't afford that. We need to go forward with lower taxes and more growth in our state. Gretchen Whitmer. Yeah, again, more positions, not plans. Everyone in this room is here. We're talking about mobility. We're talking about talent. We're talking about infrastructure. These are investments we have to make. If Michigan's going to be the place that our economy grows with our personal incomes, we have to get these things right, and it's on the next governor to do it, not just throw out positions. The next question goes to Brian Kelly and Shri Tanandar. You know, news of a $4 billion tax incentive for Amazon to relocate to Michigan has raised debate over the function of tax incentives. As governor, would you use tax breaks and incentives for companies and how? Brian Kelly. You can't use tax incentives to make up for a bad 
environment. That's why we spent so much time <laughs> focusing on creating a good environment for everybody that is already here in our state, and it has worked. 540,000 new private sector jobs. We've seen a 17-year low in unemployment. We're a top 10 state on income growth. So as we move forward, Talent is a new currency of economic development. Ten years ago, I heard from people in this, uh, in this conference that they were just trying to struggle to survive to get past to the next year. Today, what we hear is we can't find enough people to fill all the jobs. And so as we move forward, the most important thing we can do is invest in our people. And that means to have a world-class K-12 system. It means we commit ourselves to lifelong learning, that we bring back skilled trades in a big way. It means the Marshall Plan for Talent to make sure that we are connecting our people with everything that they need to go out there and compete and win in a 21st century global economy. Sri Tanadar. Well, in Michigan, we need a new direction. We need to make a U-turn from the corporate welfare that's been practiced in the last seven years. And what happened with Amazon is a wake-up call that this system of giving hundreds of millions of dollars to corporation is not working. This kind of a Band-Aid solution, trying to get a photo off for our politicians, not solving fundamental problems of Michigan. We need to need big ideas, and that's what I bring. We need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to have skilled workforce. We need to have a good education system. Businesses will come to Michigan without having to be bribed them. And Amazon is a good wake up call why the current system is wrong for Michigan. Brian Kelly, rebuttal. Maybe I could remind everybody that it wasn't very long ago when Michigan wasn't in the hunt for anything, right? That people were, were leaving our state. We had a mass exodus of our greatest resource, which is our kids. They were finding other places for, for jobs and opportunity. Now, we know that we still have work to do here in our state, but we have come a long way. To be even in the conversation on these, uh, on these big deals like Amazon is a huge improvement from where we were. But in order to get to the point where we're landing deals like that, it is about the talent. It is about making sure that we have the kind of people here in our state that have access to everything that they need to go out there and compete and thrive in the global economy. Okay. Nolan? Our next pairing uh, is no, Shri Shri Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. That was my fault. Uh, I jumped probably. the gun. Go ahead, Sri Tanadar. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, um, basically investing in Michigan, we need to, uh, you know, the fundamental approach needs to be bringing skill set uh, to Michiganders. Uh, we need to bring technical vocational skills in high school and middle school. We need to make two-year colleges free of tuition so people can acquire the skills they need for jobs of tomorrow. With the technology coming in, we need to create jobs for tomorrow. So now we'll go to our next pairing. Abdul El Sayed and Patrick Kolbeck. Senator Kolbeck, you've accused Dr. El Sayed of having ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and even suggested he might bring Sharia law to Michigan. Are you playing to the bigotry of voters? Uh, no, I think uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed is right now, and he's going off and playing a uh, religion card and he's playing a race card when all I did was highlight his association with a organization affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a terrorist organization. And that's not me saying that. That is a majority Muslim country, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or UAE. Those are all majority Muslim countries. And in response, I just want to point out, because this has been labeled as hate speech by me associating with that, the hate speech has been coming from Dr. Abdul Sayed. When we were in front of 150 members of the Michigan Press Association, he said, you may not hate Muslims, but Muslims definitely hate you. That is the definition of a hate speech. And he's been known to also to say that he wants to be known as the 215 pound middle finger to Donald Trump. That is not something that I think the citizens of Michigan, that's not the attitude the citizens of Michigan want to support. I think they need to be aware of his ties and I think he needs to be doing some exp explanation around those ties. Dr. El Saad, you weigh 215 pounds? Yeah. <laughs> You wear it well. Thank you. Thank you. I was a high school linebacker and all, you know. Um, I brought my constitution with me. And I know I'm not allowed to use a prop, but the constitution is not a prop. Fact is, is that this constitution protects my right to pray as I choose to pray. 
and also protects my right to aspire to the highest ideal of citizenship. And every time we hear this, it speaks to a long history of people who look a little bit different than the senator, trying to do something that is perfectly within their rights and then having their very Americanness question. We've seen this before. But to be frank, it's a distraction. Because at the end of the day, the kind of exclusionary language that we're hearing is exactly what's locking people out all over the state. An education system that's failed our kids in Detroit, the fact that we can't even give people water in that city, the fact that Flint got poisoned, 9,000 kids, and we're still worried about clean water, that kind of exclusionary thinking is exactly what's run government for too long. It's exactly what I'm standing up for. And as an American, I have that right. Senator Kobach, here with yep. Otto. Yeah, obviously, it's very clever. He's trying to make it about religion. It's never been about religion, and he knows it. Um, the, uh, and he talks about the Constitution. He's also someone who proposes to have Michigan as a sanctuary state. I encourage him to read Article 6, Section 2, which is the Supremacy Clause in our US, U.S. Constitution. That talks about the fact that we've got uh, supremacy for our federal laws, and sanctuary state essentially ignores that. Dr. El Sayed? So, you know, the way that racism works is that it's a distraction. And my colleagues got to talk a little bit about the economy, and I want to talk about that too. So let me tell you about what an inclusive economy looks like. An inclusive economy is one where every kid gets the opportunity to succeed. Doesn't matter who you are, who your parents are, where you were born, where you went to school, that you get the right to thrive. That you don't get poisoned because of where you grew up, that you get to get a great education independent of who you are. That's how we build a state that actually captures all of the things that all my colleagues talked about. We do that, we stop paying corporate subsidies, that's how we succeed in Michigan. Our next question goes to the Republican candidates, uh, and it is an echo of the earlier question posed to the Democratic candidates. As governor, what priority is K-12 education? How would you change funding for schools and governance structure within the Department of Education? We start with Bill Schutte. Thank you. Well, my wife Cynthia and I and our uh, daughter Heidi and son Bill went to the Midland Public Schools. We had great schools, great education, uh, my wife and I and our children. But not everybody has that uh, good fortune. And the fact is, is there's too many kids trapped in schools that are failing. And you look at our third grade reading scores that are the lowest in America. When only 35% of our third graders are proficient in reading, they've, they've been failed. And that means that uh, an opportunity for, to look through a prism of opportunity and hope is pretty uh, gloomy and dim. You know, America has been uh, de described as a shining city on a hill, but if you can't read the directions to get there, if you can't spell opportunity, you're, you're lost. And we need to grade our schools A through F. We need to provide grants for those higher performing schools to reward them. I believe in incentives. As governor, I'm going to have a literacy director smack dab in my office, a cabinet level position to uh, enhance this serious issue of reading. And when I'm governor, Michigan's children will read. I'm going to build a reading foundation. Where the, thank you. It's an important issue. Uh, Patrick Holbeck? It is an important issue. <laughs> and uh, the first step is eliminating this top-down control of our education system by the federal government and also by the state government. We need to return, government, or return our education back to the classroom and the parents and the teachers and the students. Um, we need to eliminate Common Core standards. It was a failed experiment. As a member of the Senate Education Policy, I kept asking for proof. Show me how this is actually going to improve the performance of our kids in school. I have never provided that proof until two years after I started asking for it. And they showed this little stochastic diagram that actually showed some uh, nebulous uh, positive correlation with Common Core standards and NAEP performance. Turns out I could have written uh, one that showed negative correlation, had the same statistical validity. It was a failed experiment. It's something we need to get away from. I'm a big proponent of school choice. I think if we empower parents with the opportunity to choose where they take their kid to school, that's how you're going to go off and improve quality, and all boats will rise when we improve quality in that way. Ryan Callen? Hey, don't I, don't I get, uh, After he goes, uh -oh. then you'll get all your right. rebuttal. Yep. Go ahead. Education is my number one priority and it's pre-K all the way through lifelong learning. We have to dispense with the notion that you ever get done with education. The world changes, it changes so fast. So we have to connect our people, give them the tools that they need to change with the world so they can go out there and compete and win in an increasingly global economy. But it starts early. If you want to have a good outcome, you have to have a good beginning. So that means making sure our kids start school ready to learn. If you want to know what I think about a good model for that, take a look at what we're doing at Educare in Flint. 
right? This is a model that I think is, is really important for helping kids that face all kinds of non-educational barriers to learning to get past that. And then it's about supporting our teachers. Teachers are heroes. We should be treating our teachers as heroes the same way we think as police, police officers and firefighters and people fighting for us overseas. The teachers are the heroes. We need to support them and giving them all the tools that they need to, to teach kids and help them overcome every single challenge regardless of what it is, whatever's in the way of them learning. Now you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Rebuttal. You know, here's the point. Um, education is so vitally important, and we need to also have apprenticeship uh, en enhancement because not everyone needs to be a software engineer uh, living in San Francisco. Rather, there are value jobs and important jobs in the skilled trades. And Patrick's right about Common Core. I don't think we should have that. And I'm a big fan of charters, giving parents more choice and options where they want to have their child go to school. Patrick Olmeck. Hey, thank you very much. I think the reason I'm so opposed to top-down systems like Common Core is because it forces our teachers to focus on testing instead of actually going off and instructing our kids. Because you've got to feed the monster upstream. You've got to tell them what, how the students are performing so that they can report back and play this control game. That's why I'm an advocate of Enhanced Michigan Education Savings Program. It actually puts the parents in control of how their education dollars are spent. That's the way we need to proceed as a state. Brian Kelly. We need to dispense with the notion that we have to pick between trades and academics. This is really important for our economy because accountants need plumbers and plumbers need accountants. And so you can use the trades to teach the academics in real world ways where the academics stick more. I mean, this is a great opportunity in front of us. We need to innovate in the classroom to make that happen. I also want to point out I'm the only candidate on this stage that has a plan specifically for special education because every single kid, including those with disabilities, is entitled to an education. All right, the next question will be for the Democratic uh, candidates, and it'll be a flip of what the Republicans first answered when we started the debate tonight. So what is your specific plan to finally repairing Michigan's roads, and are you willing to raise taxes to do it? If not, where is the money coming from? And we're going to start with Gretchen Whitmer. Well, thank you. I'm glad for this question. I'll tell you, I have traveled all 83 counties as a candidate for governor, and that is no small task. I've put tens of thousands of miles on my Ford Expedition and replaced two windshields in the process. But here's the thing. You can drive with a cracked windshield. You cannot drive with a busted rim. I have met so many people in our state who've been sidelined by a pothole that cost them $800 that could have been money for rent, could have been money toward a family vacation or a kid's education. Here's the thing. We have to get serious about fixing infrastructure in Michigan. It's time to fix the dam roads. But infrastructure includes the water pipes underneath the ground, connecting everyone to broadband. If we want to have the edge in mobility, we can't have gravel roads. We've got to be connected. And so I put an infrastructure plan on the table that is a three billion dollar investment. It is real and we can get it done. We must get it done because we're all paying to fix our cars where we should be paying to fix the roads. Sri Tanandar. Well, definitely, yes. Uh, we need to invest in infrastructure. I think the, uh, the estimate is somewhere around four to six billion dollars. Uh, my tax plan would be a graduated tax plan where I would be making sure that the rich, the ultra rich, and the corporations pay their fair share. That means I will be the only gubernatorial candidate in the history of the United States that want to raise taxes on himself. So I will give a tax break for any family that makes $50,000 or less. They will be exempt from state income tax. However, the corporations and people making over $200,000, which is everybody here, uh, will pay a little more taxes because, you know, the last governor wanted to run this state like a business. I want to run this state like a family. We are one big family. We need to chip in to make it helpful to the ones that need help. Abdul Al Said. Again, it's been seven long years. I heard the Republicans talking about how they're just now getting to fixing the infrastructure. After what, 9,000 kids get poisoned in Flint? while our roads have never been worse, while our schools are literally crumbling and mold is growing out of the gym, we've got to start doing this now. Our state is literally crumbling. If you wanna talk about an economic plan that works, start building the places where people are being asked to build themselves business. Because the big businesses here who keep getting the tax breaks, they're not the ones doing it. They're offshoring, automating our jobs. We've got to start thinking about how we actually build the means of small business and that requires infrastructure. 
Now let's talk about how we do it. We've got a plan for a pure Michigan infrastructure bank. That infrastructure bank allows us to invest more, allows us to invest over time, and allows us to think through projects that include things like our schools and include things like moving our energy infrastructure to 100% renewable, things that don't usually get talked about because we're so busy talking about the damn roads. So let's think about what a big fix looks like. Let's make that investment. Let's do it smart, and let's get it done. All right, let's go to our rebuttal. Gretchen Whitmer. I'll just say, every day on the road, there's someone that tells me a story that puts a finer point on what this is all about. I spoke to a mom who was visiting her child in the Detroit Children's Hospital, driving in from Flint every day. She hit a pothole that cost her $800 to fix her car. It was time away from her sick child. She had to call on family to help her pay the bill in order to hustle home and take care of the rest of the family. It is time for us to fix the damn roads, to make sure every community has clean water and that we get connected to broadband so we can maintain an edge in mobility. I have a plan to get it done. Rebuttal, Shri Tanadar. Well, when, when I was growing up in India, my family fell into dire poverty, and I saw my mother raise uh, four girls, two boys, and my, my dad, and I've seen her a strong woman. I respect her, and uh, you know, I respect her for what I learned from her. I learned from her how to be, never give up, how to stand for your rights, make a plan, and provide leadership, and that's what I would do when I'm in Lansing, uh, work with uh, the Democrats for sure, but also work with the Senate. Uh, possibly Republican, to make our infrastructure top notch. Abdul Al Sayed, rebuttal. Your time starts now. Thank you. Look, when we talk about why these things don't get done, I, I want us to think about what we're doing in this room right now. You got lobbyists from big corporations, they're paying off politicians, almost everybody else on this stage, to make sure that they keep getting their tax cuts and that we don't have the money to invest. If we're serious about building Michigan, if we're serious about building small business and attracting and growing our talent, then we've got to stop with that. Everybody has to pay their fair share. Let's stand up and say everybody's rate's the same, and if you make a lot of money, maybe you should pay a little bit more. That's how we build the infrastructure that we need, and we can't get it done without the money. Thank you. Now let's go to Bill Schutte and Abdul El Sayed. Governor Snyder expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Republicans now want to add a work requirement. Is it appropriate to ask Medicaid recipients to get a job, and can you sustain this program for the long term? Uh, let's start with Bill Schutte. Good question, and I happen to support the efforts of the Michigan Senate to ha add a requirement of work for able-bodied able adults. I think it's important in terms of our culture and ethic, and it's important in terms of efficient uh, expenditure of taxpayers, you know, uh, resources. And what's important here is also that let's have Michigan, let's have Michigan design what our health care plan will be in the future. Instead of having it done in Washington, this ought to be done by the states. And block granting it, I think, is an important uh, uh, aspect of that. And you know, I, what I think is important is that President Trump, who has endorsed my candidacy, and I appreciate that, what he has done is uh, dismantled Obamacare. So now people uh, aren't having to pay that tax, and you can choose your own doctor. That's the plan I think is important for us as we go forward in the future. Dr. Elsayed? I'm a doctor. I'm the only person up on this stage that's ever had to deliver a diagnosis and then watch as somebody had to worry about how they were going to pay for it, let alone what the treatment was for that ailment. That should never happen in Michigan. And the fact that Healthy Michigan was created, I think that's great, and I'm very thankful to President Obama for the ACA. But let's be clear. These work requirements that they want to impose are fundamentally, at their core, racist. They exclude people in rural communities where there's a high unemployment rate, but they land smack dab on the urban communities in communities like Detroit and Flint and Benton Harbor. It's not right and it's unfair. And I'd stand against them all day long. But we've gotta go further. Every single Michigander deserves healthcare. healthcare. 600,000 Michiganders currently don't have it. And that's something we never should allow. We need a single payer health system for Michigan. Next week we will release our plans. People will save money. We will live longer, healthier lives. People will have the healthcare that they need and we'll do it without having to kowtow to the blue crosses of the world that have dominated our system as it stands. Bill Schutte, your rebuttal. Well, this is a great discussion because there's a huge difference of vision and philosophy between me and the, my Democratic uh, friends, Senator Whitmer, Dr. El-Sayed, and Mr. Thanedar. They want a single-payer system, which would be a disaster. 
Look at the VA. I have a 99-year-old father-in-law, and he needs to be honored like every other veteran in terms of quality health care, and the VA is not matching up to that. And you look at the plans that uh, my Democrat colleagues have. It is more taxes, more rules. It is a sequel to the Jennifer Granholm failed governorship, and we would be going downhill, not enough jobs, and we would not compete with other states across America. Abdul al We do have a different vision. After all, Donald Trump has endorsed your candidacy. <laughs> I mean, Fact is, fact is, when I walk to the river from our offices, I can see a place where they pay less, they live longer, and they're happier with their health care. And the fact that we don't have that in Michigan means that 600,000 people don't get the care they need. God bless your father. But the fact is, he probably plays way too much in prescription drugs because we've allowed those drug companies to lobby so that we <laughs> charge our seniors more than almost any other society in the world. Time's up. I want to help them out. Time's up. The next question goes to Brian Kelly and Gretchen Whitmer. What is this state's long-term obligation to the citizens of the city of Flint, and how do we fulfill that obligation? We start with Gretchen. Okay, well, let's start with the Emergency Management Act. You know, when Governor Snyder and the Republicans pushed the Emergency Management Act through, I was the top Democrat in office, and I was fighting them on it. I was worried about the consequences of stripping a community of self-governance. And we have seen the people of Flint pay the most dire price for failed government on every level. Children brushed their teeth with poison for two and a half years before anyone in their state government did a darn thing about it. Many families in Flint still do not have access to clean water, and frankly, I was appalled when just a few weeks ago, Nestle got authority to pull 60% more water out of the ground, and the people of Flint were cut off from bottled water. I worked with the Teamsters in the UAW and went to Flint and passed out bottled water to help people. But that's not enough. We have a long-term need to fulfill and support the children of Flint. They are going to have lifetime consequences that are already manifesting themselves in lack of attention and Brian. in our schools, yeah. Brian? I, I want to first point out that, that Detroit would still be in a position of, uh, of insolvency and bankruptcy if it wasn't for the Emergency Manager Act. When it comes to what happened in Flint, we have a stark contrast here between me and, frankly, everybody else on this stage. Do you want the type of leadership at a time of crisis that will point fingers and look backward and argue about it? Or do you want somebody who will move there, go on, be on the ground with people working shoulder to shoulder, not for photo ops, right? Not for just a few hours, but to literally be there so much. In 2016, I worked in Flint so much that I paid the Flint City income tax return, income tax. It's, that was my place of work. And it wasn't just infrastructure, although it included infrastructure. It was health care, and it was education, and it was economic development and nutrition. And that, that's the type of leadership that we need in the time of a crisis. Flint is the easiest city in the world to fall in love with, and it's an amazing place I will see the work through. Gretchen. You know, the lieutenant governor's right. We need to look forward. But you know what? You can't learn anything if you don't look back and look at the mistakes that happened. The most dire consequences have been paid by families. I think about the children and parents of Flint every time I turn on the tap. You understand that there are kids who will pay a lifetime consequence for the failure of our attorney general and our governor's office and our legislature making decisions based on dollars and cents on a balance sheet and not what it meant to people's lives. Brian. I could point back to 40 years or 50 years worth of failure in the city of Flint when it comes to leadership and, and making the things happen that need to happen in order to create a great life for people. But the fact of the matter is that we need to be looking forward on what happens there today. And Flint is on a roll right now with things like Educare that has been launched in that city will change the face of early childhood education in Michigan, like the Capitol Theater Project, like the Ferris Wheel, like Lear adding hundreds of new jobs in Flint. Flint is on a roll. It is an amazing place. And again, I will see the work through. 
This next question is for Patrick Kolbeck. And we please remind the audience we're going to keep moving, so please hold your applause till the end. Question is for Patrick Kolbeck and Sri Tanadar. Great Lakes are a precious resource. Two concerns, the Line 5 pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac and the recent increase in water withdrawals granted to Nestle. As governor, would you push for policy to shut down Line 5 and change water withdrawal amounts? Why or why not? We're going to start with Patrick Kolbeck. Okay, the thing that we need to do and need to focus on when it comes to Line 5 is what's the most reliable way to get fluids and gas from point A to point B. And as an engineer who's actually done failure modes and effects analyses, I know for a fact that the most reliable way of doing that is via pipes. And um, so you could go off and put trucks up there, you could put freighters up there. They're all more likely to have a spill to harm our environment than putting a pipeline. Now, having said that, we want to make sure that that pipeline is maintained. And so I want to make sure that we take care of that. When it comes to Nestle, I believe that we have a good neighbor policy we need to put in place. So we make sure that if they're drawing down water, they've got to make sure they're not impacting any of their neighbors around there to the point where they start impacting them and lowering the water levels in nearby rivers, then they need to be held accountable and say, stop, guys. Um, but I think we also need to point out the, the quality of water that we're getting from the Great Lakes Water Authority. And we've got a case here where feeder number three is shut down and it's backed up sewage into people's homes and it led to a hepatitis A outbreak under the watch of Dr. Abdul Al Sayed, I may add. And that's something that was just a bureaucratic oversight. Okay, Sri Tanandar, I want to remind our candidates we're not to attack someone that we are not debating at this time with this certain question. Sri Tanandar. Well, Michigan cannot afford another Flint-like disaster. If Enbridge Line 5 breaks, it's going to cost $6.3 billion to fix that problem. We cannot take that risk. I'm a scientist. I've seen photographs of the coding that has gone bad on these lines. We must shut down Enbridge Line 5 immediately. They have broken their easement with Michigan. We have every right to do that, that we must enact immediately. We are sitting on world supply of 21% of fresh water. We are stewards of Great Lakes. We need to protect our Great Lakes for ourselves and for our grandchildren. We need to not allow Nestle or corporations take advantage of it, steal our water. I will stop that. I will keep Michigan water in Michigan. Thank you. Patrick Kolbeck, rebuttal. Yeah, obviously, our waterways are extremely important. I come from a family of fishermen. My grandpa used to take me out fishing by Pesh Island when I was knee-high to a grasshopper. And I grew up can canoeing the, the waterways of Michigan. I love our natural beauty that's out there, and we're not going to do anything that's going to compromise that. We have to be rational when it comes to our policies, and I have an engineering person perspective on that to make sure we do what's best for the people of Michigan. Sri Tanandar, rebuttal. Well, I want to put uh, Pure back into Pure Michigan. You know, we need to hold corporations accountable when we have phosphate runoffs into our lakes causing toxicology problems. We have corporations leaving behind chemicals, toxic carcinogenic chemicals in our soil which find its water into the waterway. We need to protect our waters, and as a scientist, I will enforce the regulations to make sure that. Thank you. Brian Kelly and Abdul El Sayed, uh, if recreational marijuana legalization is on the ballot this fall, how will you cast your personal ballot? And if it passes in your governor, how would you implement legalization? Let's start with Abdul El Sayed. Listen, this is a civil rights issue. Fact is, is that you're, if you're African American in this country, you're 3.3 times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession despite no higher likelihood of use. It is the reason why we have brimming jails and we don't have the means of investing in our schools. And so we've got to legalize. Also, as a doctor, I know that sometimes people need this medication as treatment. And right now, we don't know how to use it because it's illegal. And so we've got to stand up and make sure that we can test this We've got to stand up and make sure that this is no longer the civil rights issue that sustains. And one of the things we have to remember is that right now, right now, there is a chance that when this is legalized, you've got big corporations that move in and take the wealth and the money from this out of local communities. We've got to make sure that we are investing in local entrepreneurs and local communities. We've got to make sure that we are studying the use of cannabis as a medication. We've got to make sure that we are using the money that comes out of this to invest in our schools and invest in our roads, things that the current administration under Lieutenant Governor have not done. Time. Uh, Brian Kelly. 
I don't support recreational marijuana legalization. If the people do approve it, of course, I will respect the will of the voters. But you know what I'm much more concerned about than that is the opioid addiction epidemic. That's why I led the opioid task force here in our state. It is taking so many lives every year. It's stealing away futures from, from our kids and from our parents. I've seen it completely destroy lives. Every, people in this room, I know that just a, a, a group this size, I don't care what your socioeconomic status is, that it has hit you. But there are no throwaway people. And we can't treat addiction by throwing people in jail. We have to help people get past that addiction. We have to, to provide treatment in order to help people get better, help the brain to heal, get over the addiction. And I think if we spend our time focusing on the important things like that, that we'll build a better future for ourselves, our kids, and our grandkids. Abdul al Sayed. So as a doctor, I can tell you that the reason we have a raging opioid epidemic is because we've got an issue with treating people with pain. Marijuana is a pretty good way to do that. And the fact is, is that those two things are connected. As a doctor, I know the responsibility we have to the opioid epidemic. I'm uniquely well situated to think through how we raise funds for mental health that have been cut and cut and cut by Republican administrations and how we make sure we bring doctors together and create prescription guidelines that are enforceable. If we want to fix this problem, we can't just talk about it, we gotta be about it. As a former health commissioner, I know exactly how to do that. And Brian Kelly. Of course I support medical marijuana and the use of medical marijuana. It may very well have a role to play in defeating the opioid addiction epidemic. I've seen it make a difference in the, in the lives of, of uh, people that have seizure disorders or, or people that have uh, cancer and need to get over nausea and, and, and achieve weight gain. I mean, it has a really important part and I will defend that till the end. Next question goes to Bill Schutte and Sri Tanadar. Uh, cities uh, across the state are struggling to provide basic services because of the massive cuts to revenue sharing. How would you address that, Bill Schutte? The biggest issue Michigan has is making sure we grow. And we need to compete against all the other states in America and win. This is about winning again in Michigan. Because you see, we are, we've rebounded, but we're still 300,000 jobs short of where Michigan was during the Great Recession. And there are 55 counties in Michigan in this decade have lost population. So we need to grow and stimulate our economy. And what an important part of that is cutting auto insurance rates. I was in uh, uh, Ironwood just uh, earlier this week and went to the Stormy Cromer business. By the way, you ought to buy one of those hats. They're very nice. And uh, going through the factory line, I saw uh, a woman named Joan, and she said, Bill, we need to cut, cut auto insurance rates. You know, we need to do that, and that'll stimulate, I think, our economy, and it'll help our state grow so we're attractive to the millennials so they're not paying the highest auto insurance rates in the nation. And that is an important part for our economic plan for Michigan's future. Shri Tanadar. When in the state of the state address, our governor was taking victory laps, talking numbers. Communities across Michigan are hurting. I've traveled to Flint, I've tra traveled to Benton Harbor, Highland Park. Poverty in the 40% range, 45% of the people, high unemployment, crime. 45% of the people have felony records who can't get jobs. We need to have this economy work for all of us. We are all one big family, and we need to care and take care of our cities. We need to have revenues in proportion to the local needs, and then Lansing needs to step away and let the local government pick and choose what they want to do and what they want to fix at the local level. We need to bring compassion and love back into Lansing. The best way to help our local communities is to make sure we have a state that grows. And we need to be a growth state. So we need to cut taxes in Michigan, eliminate that grand home income tax increase. We need to cut auto insurance rates. And we need to have third grade reading scores that go up instead of being at the bottom. That's part of the course for us to grow in the future and win. Sri Thanada. So once the recreational marijuana passes, I would like to use my power and find a legal way to uh, you know, look at do, at do serious prison reforms. We need to ensure that people with small position charges are not in the prison, so is people that cannot afford a bail uh, are in the prison without any convictions. We need a serious uh, prison reforms and we need to expunge records so people can uh, find uh, employment back again. 
and be productive members of the society. All right, thank you. Since we've already been talking about some auto rates, let's jump right in. This question is for Patrick Kolbeck and Gretchen Whitmer. The legislature has been unable to come to an agreement on reforming no-fault insurance. Meanwhile, Michigan, as you know, is among the highest insurance rates in the country. Detroit's are astronomical. How would you fix no-fault? I'll start with Gretchen Whitmer. Sure. Well, first of all, was your question about revenue share and he's going to fix it with Stormy Cromer's in love? Was that the answer? <laughs> anyway, auto insurance is an important issue to everyone in the state of Michigan. I've traveled all 83 counties, and I know that the cost of auto insurance is, is something that people look at before they even look at their car note. It's that expensive. And Detroiters feel it more acutely than other people in the state, but we're all feeling it. I believe that there are some fundamentals that have to be a part of a solution on, on, on auto insurance, and I am excited about working with anyone who wants to solve this problem. Mayor Duggan's been leading the way. We've had a lot of great conversations about how we solve this. I believe that some fundamentals are ensuring that the catastrophic claims fund is open to real transparency. Part of the reason for increasing rates every year is that there needs to be more money in the catastrophic claims fund, but the rub is we're not allowed to know how much is in it. Number two, so long as the insurance industry is able to decide rates on non-driving factors like your credit rating, your zip code, your marital status, your education level, I don't think we're going to solve the real problem. So I think those are pieces to it. That's time. Patrick Holbeck. Thank you. Everybody up here is very good at framing the problems. Very few are ready to go off and define the solutions. And, and when it comes to auto insurance rates, we've had this taste great, less filling debate where we've got people that want to lower the cost of auto insurance, but then at, this, at the same time, you want people to protect their lifetime benefits. If you've been in a traumatic brain injury uh, accident, um, a quarter million dollars isn't going to last very long. It's going to last maybe three months. So you've got to go off and protect that. So what I've done is I've gone back and looked at my own insurance premium. And I identified where all the costs were coming from and identified the fact that these costs, 40% of them, actually a total of 58% of the costs are coming from state mandates. You eliminate the state mandates, you can easily get to 40% without putting any risk associated with lifetime benefits, and you can get to 60% if you reevaluate how, uh, how we allocate funds from the Michigan Catastrophic Fund. It's something that, as an engineer, I try to find solutions with multiple requirements. I think we can fix it. Gretchen Whitmer, rebuttal. Well, I do agree with Senator Colbeck. We have to protect people that have been catastrophically injured, but we have a duty to bring rates down where we can. You know, the protections, the, the efforts to eliminate fraud in the system and make sure the door swings both ways, to ensure that we've got uh, caps on fees is a discussion that is worth having. Um, this is something that is not a simple solution, but we've got a mandate to fix this, and I want to sign a bill in the first six months of next year. Patrick Colbeck. All right, if you look at your insurance premiums like I've done, about 70% of the costs actually relate to health insurance. That's why I've been focused on free market health care solutions in our, in our state. If you can lower the cost of delivering good quality health care by eliminating certificate of need, by going off and promoting my direct primary care approach to health care, which has been nationally recognized, not just recognized state level, by Forbes.com and by Heritage Foundation and numerous other organizations, that's what we can do to turn Michigan into the center of a free market health care revolution. That will lower our auto insurance costs as well. All right. Well, we have moved through this hour pretty quickly. It is time now for our closing statements, and we are going to go in alphabetical order by party again as how you were introduced. So we will start with Abdul Al-Sayed. I had the opportunity to rebuild Detroit's health department. In that role, we did things like make sure kids had a free pair of glasses delivered at school, 7,000 pairs of glasses delivered in two years, stood up to some of the biggest corporate polluters in the state when they wanted to continue to poison the airs our kids breathe. We made sure our kids weren't exposed to lead after we heard about what was happening in Flint, had every school, daycare, and Head Start tested for lead in the water. Every single project, though, led me to a door of a politician, and those doors are almost always closed. They only open when you've got money, and we've got to address that system. We've got to break the corporate chokehold on our politics. This is supposed to be a government for people and by people. That means we have to center people again. That's what this movement is about, and I look forward to you joining us. Brian Kelly. Our state has come so far in the last eight years under the leadership of Governor Snyder and I. And by the way, I want to point out that I do have the endorsement of Governor Snyder. <laughs> this, we have been on a remarkable, a remarkable comeback. 540,000 new jobs, a 17-year low in unemployment. We are a top 10 income growth state 
during that time. Before, our biggest problem was not enough jobs. Today, the biggest problem that we face in our state in, a way, in the way of further economic growth, and Michigan being a bigger growth state, is that we don't have enough people to fill all the jobs that are being created. That's why I'm focusing on education, on talent workforce development, on the Marshall Plan for Talent, on social service reform, getting people back to work instead of just sustaining them in a place of dependency. It's about fixing our roads and auto insurance Thank reform. You. And I will Thank you deliver as your governor. Sri Tanadar. Forty years ago, I immigrated to the United States, got a PhD in chemistry. As an entrepreneur, created hundreds of jobs all across America. Imagine four years from now, uh, we meet here again. As Michigan's governor, I tell you, we have taken our education to the top 10. We have fixed Michigan's crumbling infrastructure, and we have hundreds of thousands of skilled workers ready for a job for tomorrow. Michigan needs a difference. And will it matter when I tell you that where I was born, how I look, or my accent? I will make a difference in Michigan. I need your support. I need your, your vote on August 7th and November Thank 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Holbeck. As serving as governor is about leadership. And President Reagan once asked us to paint in bold colors, not pale pastels. And he, he used to be a Democrat, by the way. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what I'll do as your next governor. I talk about principled solutions because I've got principled solutions. Those principled solutions have been earned the endorsement of automotive legend Bob Lutz because I tackle complex problems with innovation. I've earned the endorsement of David Littman, former chief economist of Comerica Bank, because I look at the expense side of the equation, not just the revenue side. I've earned the endorsement of Senator Ted Cruz because I'm not afraid to take principled stands. And I've and, uh, earned the endorsement of Catherine Engelbrecht, a true the vote, because I helped reform and, and identify voter, 31 counts of voter fraud in our last election. And that's, passion, that's what her passion is about. We need principled solutions. I encourage you to vote for me for governor. Thank you. Gretchen Whitmer. I'm Gretchen Whitmer, and I'm running for governor because I love the state of Michigan. You know, I look around at the Michigan that my kids are growing up in, and I know we deserve better. We're going to fix the damn roads, and we're going to make sure every child in this state has a great education that leads them on the path to a high wage skill. And I crossed the aisle to work with Rick Snyder to deliver health care to 680,000 people in this state. I'm ready to go to work for the people of this state. Everyone on this stage has, you know, has positions. I have plans. I want to make this the Michigan that our kids stay in and make their lives in, that our families can thrive in, and that other people come to for opportunity. Every Michigander deserves a governor who works just as hard as they do. I'm ready to get Thank to you. work. Thank you. Thank you. That's time. Bill Schutte. Thank you. <clears throat> Michigan's future is about more jobs and bigger ch paychecks, and I intend to be Michigan's jobs governor. We need to cut taxes in Michigan like President Trump has cut taxes across America because tax cuts mean more jobs. We need to cut auto insurance rates because they're the highest in America. That needs to change. Our third grade reading scores are the lowest in the land. When I'm governor, Michigan's children will read. And elections are about choices. Who has the experience, uh, energy, and skill set to serve as Michigan's next CEO? And it's about uh, are we going forward or going backwards? We're not going backwards. We can't afford a sequel of the failed governorship of Jennifer Granholm. We're going forward. We're going from good to great. We're going to win again. And I sure need your vote. Thank you. And thanks to all of our candidates. How about a round of applause for them? Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to the Detroit Regional Chamber, Nolan Finley, Stephen Henderson. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, good night. This broadcast was made possible in partnership with WKAR.